We're on the air, counselors. You made it just in the nick of time. So welcome uh, to the Finance Committee meeting of May 23rd, 2017. We're here to talk about the 2018 budget and review with the department heads. Uh, this is posted as a Finance Committee meeting, but many of the other counselors are here as well. So I'm going to have Pam take the roll call of finance, and then we'll introduce the other counselors. Councilor Murphy? Here. Councilor Carney? Present. Councilor Labarge? Present. Councilor Dash is not with us yet. En route. He is en route. He is en route. Uh, I'd like to point out we also have Councilor Labarge here, and Councilor O'Donnell here, and Councilor Bidwell here, and Councilor Scary here, and Councilor Klein here, and expecting uh, Councilor Nash as well when he gets here from, uh, from I-90 where he's stuck in traffic. So this evening, as I mentioned, this is the FY18 budget review with different department heads. It's a special meeting of, of the Finance Committee with the Council invited as well. Uh, tonight's meeting will be broadcast live on NCTV. Viewers may send emails to this address, citycouncil at northamptonma.gov, that's citycouncil at northamptonma.gov, to ask questions or share thoughts with regards to the budget proposals we're doing this evening. Uh, all entries online entries need to include the writer's name and address and uh, comments or questions will be read to the presenters during the meeting. The other thing you need to understand is if you email the city council something, it becomes a matter of public record. So if you send it to us, it's not secret. You know, this is not mass live. This is going to be public record if you've sent us a question. We do need your name. Um, Please remember as you're watching the meeting that the council is empowered to cut budget line items, but we can't increase any of these expenditures. Um, following this public hearing, the budget will come up twice during our meetings in June. The city council needs to vote twice on the budget to approve it before the end of June. The new fiscal year begins on July 1. Um, so please remember. Um, if you ask a question here, it'll be televised and live, and if you send us an email question, it will become public record as well, all right? Um, we are going to, we don't have public <coughs> comment at the beginning of the meeting like we usually do, but we'll let the public in the room and the public at home ask questions when each department head finishes their presentation. So what we'll do is we'll let them do their presentation. The members of the city council will ask them some questions. And then we'll take questions from the people who are in the room and, and anyone at home that communicates with Councilor Dwight. Councilor Dwight is going to handle uh, the online questions, and I'll, I'll take the questions from the floor in the room. And uh, it, it's appropriate we should announce, the, <coughs> once again, the phone number uh, in, to text me, and the same rules apply, mm -hmm. uh, that I, you identify yourself by name and address, and the phone number is 413. 262 <laughs> I forgot my phone number <laughs> when I don't want I want to make doubly sure because if you start texting the wrong people it's just gonna look bad it's no pizza orders please. No. <laughs> uh, is it on the screen I th I is it posting on the screen yeah. never mind is the, it the number on the screen is that really is up right. there because we we can see and we can see a lower third but we can't actually read it from where we are that's what she that said that look like the correct information yeah. up there yeah. six oh. yep Pay no attention to the woman behind the curtain. 413. It is, uh, it is correct. It's, yeah. All right. So everybody at home knows more about this than we do. We'll find so, out. Absolutely. So our first department that we're going to hear from is the Department of Public Works. And Donna Lascalia is here. She is the director of the Department of Public Works. And please go ahead with your presentation, and then we'll ask you to entertain some questions. Okay. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. So the Department of Public Works budget is divided into several sections. Um, we have the general fund divisions as well as the enterprise funds which control utility operations. So I'll kind of just run through each uh, in summary and then kind of talk specifics. Um, so the general fund divisions are um, responsible for maintaining and improving our roadways, paved and unpaved, sidewalks, recreational fields, bicycle paths, bridges, of which there are 33 in Northampton, 
cemeteries, Musanti Beach, and more than 150 vehicles and pieces of specialized equipment through our mechanics. Um, the, most repairs are, are actually done in-house. Um, we also provide response, uh, obviously, to snow and ice events and, and other bad weather events. Um, we maintain road safety signage, traffic signals, um, pedestrian and, and pavement markings, and, uh, and also participate in mosquito control. Um, so that's kind of a, the, just an overview of general fund operations. Um, and then we have the enterprise funds, um, of which there are four, water, sewer, stormwater flood control, and solid waste divisions. So we have thousands and thousands and thousands of assets that we maintain through these enterprise funds. Um, we, we have uh, hundreds of miles of, of water pipes and, and sewer lines, stormwater drains, uh, more than 5,000 catch basins, 5,000 sewer and drain <coughs> manhole structures, 400 outfalls. Some of these numbers might sound familiar from the stormwater presentation that I did several months ago. Um, just to give you a, an idea of the scope, we have 100, <coughs> 110 miles of sanitary sewer, 120 miles of stormwater drain, um, 160 miles of water mains. So I, our, our buried infrastructure that you can't see is, is quite impressive. Um, additionally, we have more than 3,000 acres of watershed land that we manage and maintain. Um, to protect our public water drinking supply. We have six reservoirs and dams, um, <coughs> three of them are active. Um, we also have a flood control pump station, levee systems, a water treatment plant, wastewater treatment plant, two transfer stations, a capped landfill, and a landfill gas to energy facility. So that's just kind of a, a, an overview of, of all of the facilities that, that the DPW uh, maintains in some way. Um, so, you know, this is, this is my first year here and or the end of my first year here, so I can, assure you, I can assure you that my team and I have done a very thorough analysis of operations and administrative functions, which is reflected in this budget and certainly doesn't stop now and, and will continue uh, for, for obvious reasons. Um, what, I, what I'd like to stress more than anything is, is that this budget reflects the increasing pressure that's on this department to comply with very, very strict licensing requirements for the personnel who work for us, uh, the, the professional licensure that is required by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is, is quite strict. Um, it, and we also have incredibly strict operations requirements for our utility and general fund functions. So just in terms of professional licensure, to, to talk about that for a second, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts requires a license for, for everything from operating a forklift to operating a wastewater treatment plant. And the training and continuing education and, and licensing requirements that, that goes into maintaining this infrastructure is huge. And just to give you a few examples, um, we're talking about operating a backhoe and a loader. You need to be licensed for that. Sanitary sewer collection, catch basin cleaning, bucket truck operation is, is part of having a hoisting license. Uh, the, the sidearm mower that mows the side of the road, that requires a license and, and continuing education. Um, we're also governed by multiple regulatory authorities, including the Department of Environmental Protection. They oversee, you know, water, wastewater, landfill. Um, pretty much everything we do is is uh, commented on by them. Um, Army Corps, EPA, to name a few. Uh, we have a Water Management Act permit um, and an MS4 permit, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with as it relates to stormwater. So, you know, as I put together the budget, we have to be really cognizant of, you know, just these incredibly strict requirements that this department operates within and, and the fact that compliance is not uh, voluntary, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's something we have to do. And, and obviously, it, what I will say is, is as far as w the water side of this goes, you know, the, we're, we're a public drinking water supplier. Um, so incredibly tight controls on that. So just uh, in, in terms of, of 
highlights or things I kind of want to call your attention to. The, the utility operations are, are obviously, I, I mean, all the services we provide are critical, but, but what I want to particularly call your attention to is the utility operations. So when you look at the water enterprise, you'll see that, that we're, um, we've added a, a couple of full-time employees to the water enterprise. So again, this is, there is increasing pressure on the department to comply with these very strict DEP requirements. Um, the, the, there are new testing requirements that, that are sort of being rolled out in a phased way. Um, and we have needed to uh, adjust to this. And the way we have adjusted to it is by creating the position of DEP compliance coordinator. Um, the, the, the position is, is really responsible for uh, keeping abreast of, of all of the regulations that are necessary to keep us in compliance with DEP, making sure that, that reports are, are filed in a timely manner and that we're in complete compliance. Um, additionally, we have a chief distribution operator um, who will also be working on, on some of these regulatory issues, but, but that's why you're seeing an increase in full-time employees in water. And additionally, in the SOAR division, um, it, again, we have, to, uh, we have to maintain our infrastructure, and some of our infrastructure is, you know, aging more quickly than we would like. And, you know, it's very important for us to be very proactive in our maintenance. So you will see an increase in sewer division employees um, the, because we need to be proactive. Uh, just a, a sort of a, a really basic example of this is we have tree roots, you know, that grow into the sewer line. And we have sort of known trouble spots in the city. And if we can be proactive and get out there and, and you know, with the jet rotter a couple of times a week and hit these known trouble spots, you know, we can prevent some very significant problems. Um, so that's just kind of a, a couple of the highlights of the budget, um, but, but really a very thorough assessment of, of operations, which will certainly continue. Um, and, and, you know, the things that we have asked for are what we believe to be absolutely necessary for the, for, for the continued successful operation of the department. So I'm happy to take questions. Councilor Donald. Thank you very much for your presentation, and you mentioned how it's um, the end of your first year, and I certainly, I'm sure I speak for others when I um, say how grateful we are that you have spent this year with us and how appreciative we are of all the work that you do and all the work your staff does um, day in and day out. Um, I'm just curious, um, are there any staff additions in the sewer, enter in the sewer um, division? Or Yes, there there are. So so we have uh, staff who are allocated, so mm -hmm. they're paid across multiple divisions. So some of this represents us kind of tweaking operations and reallocating folks who already work for us. But in the sewer enterprise itself, we are proposing a, one new position, and that's for a wastewater treatment plant maintenance technician. So okay. that is a, an additional new position, and the, the reasoning behind this is obviously our, our plant is aging. Uh, we are engaging in upgrades, but it's going to be a multi-year process, so that, that kind of mechanical maintenance piece to this is, is extremely critical, and that's why we proposed the, the addition of that new position. Okay, thank you. And are there any um, kind of management level um, changes you've made to an organizational chart or practices that you could highlight that are um, of interest or not really? Sh sure. So in, in the water department, for example, the, the chief distribution operator position that mm -hmm. we've added, so we have a chief treatment plant operator. But our distribution system, as I mentioned, right, we have, you know, well over 100 miles of, of um, water mains. So we, we sort of need someone overseeing kind of the day-to-day -day operations of the distribution system. So that's, that's kind of a, mm -hmm. a management position. Um, we've also done some administrative reorganization um, and, and uh, looking at the financial operations of the DPW and uh, administration of contracts. Mm -hmm. Um, so we, we now have an administration manager <coughs> at the DPW. It's a it's a new, it's it's kind of a um, a redone position. We we had an office manager, but we've kind of enhanced the responsibilities associated with this job. Right. Okay, thank. I, I mention it because it, it's I think it's important for the public to know that 
when staff are added, it's not simply because you want to add staff. You're actually finding efficiencies, and the department is probably, it sounds like um, you're finding new ways to run the Department of Works more efficiently for better outcomes for people. That is correct. So, yes. mm -hmm. so thank you. Go ahead, please. I just said thank you. That's all. Oh. Councilor Bard, you had a yes. question. Donna, um, on the engineering division, it says license and certification. Does the city pay for their license? Yes, I the city pays for license renewal fees for all professional licensure associated with administration of your job function, whatever that might be. So we have professional engineers who work for us, and the city reimburses those licensing. Very fortunate. Students, yeah. Also, um, if you look at DPW administration division, could you explain you have the DPT, DPW director, a financial administrator, an administration manager, principal account clerk, and principal account clerk. So can you explain this? Why do we have two clerks? Is it because of the amount of work? Yes, uh, we actually have more than two clerks. Oh, okay. um, the, we have, the, the department actually has uh, six clerks. Um, and they are spread across multiple divisions. So they perform job functions related to gen the general fund, you know, cemeteries and streets. Um, and they also perform job functions that relate to solid waste or water or wastewater. So these allocations that you're seeing here represent the amount of their time that we feel that they are spending on administrative activities related to, you know, cemeteries or streets or trench permits or, or that sort of okay, thing. Because I looked on like the highway division, looking at the staff, there's 18 staff in the highway division. You've got two vacancies there. When are those going to be filled? Uh, those jobs, are, we're actually interviewing for them now. Okay. And also, um, let's see. On the cemetery division, you only have four staff, correct? That is correct. Um, we have proposed adding a position in the cemetery division this year, a laborer position, um, and, and that is uh, because it, obviously we cover a lot of ground in the cemeteries, um, and operationally we felt that, that it was necessary. I was just wondering because I don't see any vacancies on here. Yeah, there's one vacancy in the cemetery division in a laborer position. But it wasn't there at press time when we budget. Right, it's not on here. Oh, okay. I think this was, I think you submitted the budget on May 15th that didn't exist. Oh, okay. So just Okay. So one will be added on? Yes. Or no, it, it, for, there'll be four total people. Okay. Now on parks and recreation, you have five staff and one vacancy. Correct. So you're seeing uh, two foremen and three uh, uh, equipment operators as and well as a vacancy. Correct. How long has that person been off duty that it's not filled yet? And we're proposing this for this year. Uh, are you? Yes. Okay. And you have three vacancies on the water enterprise. You have 35 staff and three vacancies. Yes, correct. And when will those be filled? I mean, how long have they not been filled? The the, the timing of this is, is sort of tricky. You know, we, we go to press and then as the mayor mentioned, you know, we, we are, we're sort of filling positions as we're able to. Doing it. Um, so it, what I would say is that we are, we, are in, we are actively interviewing for those positions which are open and for those positions which have been proposed in the coming year, obviously we'll start on July 1st. But I'm, I'm just approval. curious, I've not seen so many vacancies like this. The, now I'm looking at the water treatment, and you have five vacancies there. 
So we have a WT, what is it, WTP operator, a WTP operator, a WTP operator, <coughs> WTP maintenance technician, and a laborer. That's yes, so, them. so the laborer is in new position that is being proposed for July 1st. The only two other positions that are vacant in the water treatment plant right now are for the maintenance technician and one operator. Those are our two vacancies currently. Now, let's go to Soar Enterprise. Could you explain to the public what ordinary maintenance is? What is ordinary maintenance? Of the sewer system? So that would be sort of what I described is we have known trouble spots in the city and we have a, a, a jet rotter. So it's a, a machine that clears, That's what the, that is. clears the lines with kind of high pressure. Um, you know, the, the maintenance activities that we undertake, uh, we need to keep the, uh, the, the sewage moving. So our, our ordinary maintenance of the sewer system would be any activity that keeps the sewage moving throughout the collection system. So it's, it's kind of, you know, maintenance on pipes, maintenance on structures. You know, we want to make sure the manhole covers are flush and where they're supposed to be, that sort of thing. Yeah. Councilor uh, Barge, would you would you yield to another councilor from where you've been asking questions for a while, and I know we have some. I know I would like to finish my questions. Uh, we have a limited amount of time, Councilor Barge. I got a couple more minutes, and I'll be done. Thank you. You're welcome. Wastewater treatment plant. We have three vacancies on that, and you're going to fill one. I know you did say that. Yes, so currently the maintenance technician position is proposed for July 1st and the other two vacancies we are interviewing for right now. And the solid waste, you did explain that position. And the stormwater flood control, we're pretty well set with that. What I would say is that we, we have over 100 employees. So when you ask about yeah, vacancies, yeah. you know, it's, it's definitely a, a legitimate question. And we move to try to fill vacancies as quickly as we can. But obviously, we have a, a posting process and an interview process. And, and, you know, that's something we have to work our way through. And, and people also can transfer within the department, too. So, so, you know, someone moves from one division to another division, and then you have to backfill their position. So it's, it, you know, in smaller departments, this, this is not as challenging as it is in a, in a large department. I want to thank you, Donna, for everything you've been doing at the Department of Public Works and your staff. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, counselors, any other questions from here? Councilor Bidwell. Uh, I, I too wanted to compliment you on uh, a budget that would would appear, based on what you say, meet all of the rigorous compliance uh, requirements that uh, the, that the department faces while maintaining the the quality of services. Not that it's going to happen, but what what what's 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 on the wish list if you had the next two hundred fifty thousand dollars? What are the, what are, what are the things you'd like to be getting to that you just can't? I think that, you know, I, I kind of like to say we like to see uh, improvement in, in all things. Um, it, I feel like this budget is really tight, and I, I feel like it took, you know, it took me a full 12 months to really do an assessment of what we think needed to happen. I have a brand new team. Um, money doesn't necessarily buy you um, improvement you know I, I think it, it needs to be a more thoughtful process than that so what we have asked for here it, I think is a really good start for the department and I'll be able to answer your question uh, better you know six months from now but but I feel like we're in a really good place right now and 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 you know in terms of, of putting a dollar value on it it's it, it's not necessarily uh, something that that I can do right now thank you other council questions? Because I know we have a question. Uh, Councilor Dwight has a question. A text for question. And actually, first, I'd like, in my capacity as a councilor, to ask you um, with the preamble of that um, before your time, there, this, uh, this department lived under some pretty lean budgets. Um, and you can actually see that reflected in the graphs as they move from 2014 up to current and then projection. <coughs> and so, consequently, we. We, there was a culture of deferred maintenance 
that that clearly you have to address all the things that we put off all those years because we just couldn't we 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 would cobble it together with spit and bailing wire and now you in your new capacity have uh, essentially it, it seems at least what's reflected in the budget and what's reflected in your presentations is a culture of more proactive treatment and addressing issues before they become more expensive and onerous issues is that am I is my read close to correct yes you are correct and and so, some of the you know kind of the default is like well we're just gonna throw more people at this you know I need more staff that's not necessarily an accurate statement sometimes I, I, I mean you you can say okay we need more people but you also need to tighten up operations so what this budget is reflecting is yes we've we've been sort of surgical about where we want to put people but you know the behind the scenes stuff that no one necessarily knows about is how are we internally tightening up our operations and that's how you address some of this deferred maintenance uh, now I have I do have a question from um, Evan Curris of 273 South Street and, and I think this is actually more appropriate for the mayor to address and it was um, this is are there opportunities for collaboration with neighboring towns to help navigate all the state and federal regulations that, that Donna referred to and do other towns have similar positions that do the same thing uh, uh, replication of redundancy so I, I think he's asking if there are efficiencies that can be gained by regionalization I would just say, uh, and, and I know the director can address this as well, um, we are in, involved in, for example, a regional grant um, effort through PVPC, um, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission with several other communities working on stormwater related um, issues together, um, trying to develop some um, software systems and some maintenance systems for how we're going to, because since we all have to now adapt to these new regulations, so we have done things like that. Um, generally, um, most of the communities around us have um, much smaller departments and much smaller um, infrastructure um, and much different infrastructure. So um, while we've collaborated with other communities on veterans and on other things like that, um, it's not really, uh, other than those sort of bigger <coughs> regulatory kinds of issues, um, there's not been a lot of um, regional stuff in terms of you know operations for example I'm not aware of many um, communities that have a shared DPW for example things like that um, but we are definitely always looking for for regionalization opportunities and obviously the work we're doing as part of this uh, stormwater um, uh, grant is, is an example of that at least in the DPW arena Yeah, and I can elaborate that uh, on that just a little bit. Um, th this is part of the MX4 <coughs> permit, again, which I think everyone's familiar with. Um, and it's, uh, we are collaborating with other communities through PVPC um, for stormwater mapping. So basically it's like asset management. So, so part of our MS4 permit compliance is that we first have to identify what our assets are. Now we have a very robust GIS system, but again, this, this needs uh, to be, uh, we need to be in compliance with the permit. So the, this is something that's a necessary step for us to take to, uh, to make sure that, that we're doing what we need to do. Any other from? No, that, but I'm excited we got, we got, <laughs> I got a text. Uh, right. How about from the folks that are here, does anyone here have a particular question for the DPW director on our budget? Please come forward. Uh, so we can hear you near the microphone. I don't know if you'll just hang out right there to be able to answer it. Just give us well, your name, address, uh, and your question, and then let Donna return to uh, answer it. Wayne Tebow, 830 Chesterfield Road, Florence. Uh, I know I've talked to Donna before because I'm I was involved in uh, a group trying to save the Upper Roberts Meadow Dam. But I noticed in the budget that there was uh, $250,000 towards the dam removal. Now, you probably don't know this, but years ago, when Terry Colhane, when they had the BPW, he said there was a million dollars in the Enterprise Fund to help pay for that, which you probably don't know, but that was a statement made, because the cost was going to be well over a million dollars. So with the 250, if, we, if, if the cost is over a million dollars, do you know if the money's available in some fund or anything, or? 
Mm -hmm. You probably wouldn't know that. Mm -hmm. No, I don't. It, actually, okay. she'll need to come to the microphone okay. to be heard by people. So, if you is that your full question? Uh, well, I have some other things pertaining to it, but that that would that would be the gist of it. All right. So the the two hundred fifty thousand dollars to which he refers is actually not in the budget. Um, it was uh, what what he's referring to is is the capital plan. Um, we have a million dollars worth of encumbered funds in the Water Enterprise Fund related to the removal of Upper Roberts Meadow Dam. We have spent some of those funds uh, relating to uh, permitting issues and uh, engineering services. Um, the $250,000 is not funded at this time. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, any other questions, uh, Councillor Bidwell? Uh, well, unless you, you oh, go ahead, and I'll, I'll, I'll return to the. Okay. Um, on on, on uh, the matter of Upper Roberts Dam, is there is there any money in the budget that would that would pay for further study of the extent of of uh, silting accumulation? I ask that just because I encounter the opinion that there's been sufficient silting uh, accumulated that the previous studies as to how how, how dangerous uh, would be the outcome of a of a catastrophic break are now out of date, and I never know how to answer that, and I've just wondered if there's any plans for a study that would allow us either to refute that or confirm that? Uh, the, the, what I would say to that is th there has been considerable engineering study done on Upper Roberts Meadow Dam uh, spanning many, many years, as you all know. Um, we are, the, the dam is governed by the Office of Dam Safety. The Office of Dam Safety has designated this dam as a high hazard dam. What that means is it, it needs to be removed or it needs to be repaired. The engineering studies that have been done have shown that it makes sense to remove it. Now again, this is, this is over many, many years. It, at this time, the city has invested a considerable amount of money and resources into the engineering studies we currently await the results of an archaeological survey, which is uh, under review by the Army Corps of Engineers. So it, at this time, it, the answer to your question is the engineering studies have been completed related to the removal of the dam, and we await the approval of the regulating authority. Um, any other questions? No, uh, not Roberts Meadow. Any other questions on any other topics? Please come forward. And uh, let's give us your name and address and your question. Uh, Mike Horahan, 127 Round Hill Road. Uh, just curious to know about um, whether this year's budget for DPW accounts for any of the uh, corrections that had to be made to Pulaski Park, all the orange netting up and stuff, and whether phase two, are we under budget, are we on budget? Will that be covered in this year's uh, mm -hmm. anything new? Okay, we'll let Donna address that. There is no accommodation in this year's budget for Pulaski Park because the project will be complete. We are uh, happily on budget. The orange netting that you see up is the result of a punch list from phase one. Um, so this is something we're working through with the original contractor. So the, the only accommodation we've made in the budget uh, the, for next year is more like on an operations piece, like, okay, we're going to need to spend more staff hours maintaining this. So that anything that remain, any work that remains to make corrections to phase one has been covered under phase one, the contractor is making good on it, and so there's no more budgeted money for it from this point because the contractor is obligated to make right whatever isn't right at this That's point. correct. We have retainage. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, um. <laughs> data completion. There's no, there's no data for completion yet. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, any other any other questions on any new items? No. Any other questions from here? Any other questions from the uh, online folks? Uh, no, we're good. Just just following up and seem satisfied with your answer. Thanks. You got nothing. I got nothing. No, the coast is clear. Crickets. On the email front. All right. Thank you. We're, thank okay. you because we're a little behind schedule. So thank you for your, thank you for time. Um, our next.
The speaker is going to be from Central Services. David is here. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. See you. So it's been a busy year as normal for Central Services. Uh, extremely productive and fast-paced as normal with a tremendous amount of <coughs> ongoing maintenance and operations being done in the buildings and the schools and the parking facilities every day of the week. And a whole slew of capital projects designed and implemented during fiscal 17. And that sort of pace and tenor will certainly continue for fiscal 18. Um, I can talk more about capital projects at the end uh, during questions. And what I'd like to do is just give you a brief overview of some of the highlights as I see them of the fiscal 18 budget, and we'll go from there. So overall, um, small increase. I'll talk about the central services budget first and then talk about parking maintenance. Uh, so on the central services budget, a uh, small increase of about $15,000 from fiscal 17 to 18, pretty much evenly divided between some PS and some OM. Um, on the PS side, and personnel and staffing, no changes to the number of personnel. Uh, that's 14 people in central services. That includes administrative, the energy officer, management staff, and city side custodial and maintenance. I'm not talking about the school maintenance and custodial, different budget, that's the NPS budget. Um, we will continue as we have done for probably the last four or five years, covering some of the PS charges with a combination of funding from Smith Folk, uh, city side budget, uh, NPS, and the DPW. Uh, we have staff, uh, for example, the city electrician, the HVAC tech, uh, the facilities project coordinator whose work covers pretty much all across the city. So we make up their budgets with contributions from some of the other entities besides the city budget. So again, no changes to staffing, um, just a lot of hardworking, happy people willing to uh, come to work every day and do a good job for the city. A couple of points I want to make about the OM side of the budget. Um, we have uh, ga natural gas and electricity contracts that are both coming up for renewal the end of this October. Uh, we're finishing two-year contracts. We work with an energy solicitation brokering firm out of Boston to write our bids and solicitations and help us accrue uh, both natural gas and electricity contracts. Depending on their advice, uh, we will look at either 12, 24, or 36-month contracts. Depending on pricing and the parameters we set in the bid documents, we will both use what's called brown and green energy mixes on the electricity side. Um, that process is in underway right now. We'll be looking at signing contracts probably midsummer. And I don't know at this point whether they will be 12, 24, or 36 month contracts. It depends on market forces and market conditions going forward. And we really do rely on their technical expertise as far as how we bid this. And I work closely with Susan Wright in structuring what's best for the city as far as budget cycles versus what the pricing is coming back at. Um, National Grid. Um, is raising their demand charges on our electricity pricing. Uh, this is something that has really started to spike in the last year. I'm working closely with Chris Mason in my office to understand what those charges are and how they're applied. Uh, basically, demand charges cover peak, peak usage on days when demand soars, and the demand charges are almost sort of a, an infrastructure cost that National Grid passes on to us for preserving and maintaining transmission lines, uh, generating plants, uh, substations, in the event that peak usage will occur. If it doesn't occur, you still have to pay for having that facility and the infrastructure available. So we're seeing increases in demand charges, um, which to me is more than enough of an impetus for the city to continue to aggressively push 
implementing the energy efficiency and renewable programs that we are so well known for. And um, we have uh, a number of uh, renewable technology solar programs that are ready to go. Chris is continuously working on efficiency programs to reduce our consumption in the buildings. Uh, but with the demand charge increases, it's even more reason to, to continue to push, especially on the efficiency side. Um, the big <coughs> energy news this year is that we did implement and complete the LED streetlight conversion project. Um, that was a bonded project we did. Uh, we have received almost $250,000 in rebates and incentives from National Grid to help us defray that cost. And if you look between fiscal 17's budget and fiscal 18, you will see a significant decrease in the projected cost for the streetlights. Um, one of the things of interest about the old arrangement, besides the tariff we had to pay for uh, the normal streetlights, the existing old streetlights, is that we also had to pay National Grid a $60,000 annual fee for maintenance to replace a lamp, uh, reconnect an arm on a light, even if we didn't use it didn't need their services. So that fee has now disappeared. We will be doing the maintenance on our own moving forward. We're working on how that will work. Um, but besides the rebates we're looking at and received, um, our consumption, kilowatt hour consumption, which was just over 1.1 million kilowatt hours just for streetlights, is going to drop to about 850,000, uh, it's going to drop by 850,000 kilowatts. Um, so tremendous savings moving forward. Um, and as you all know, the lifespan and life cycle of LED streetlights is multiple, multiple thousands of hours. So this is really a home run. It took us this long to implement this because we're under the guise of National Grid. All the surrounding communities are mass electric, ever source. And the rate tariffs in Boston just changed in the last year for National Grid. They finally said, yes, we'll do it. So it took us this long, but we're going to be seeing tremendous savings moving forward in a lot of different ways. A couple of notes on the OM side of, of the uh, central services budget. You'll see an increase in the preventative maintenance and contracted services. Those are the contracts and uh, vendor services we have to accrue. Some are code and regulatory related. Some are just we need to do it on an annual basis. That covers sprinkler systems, boilers, elevator inspections for the state, uh, fire extinguishers, and generators. Um, so we have uh, ongoing contracts. Most of our contracts now we will go out to bid for one year, and we build in two one-year extensions on the contracts. So if the service is fine, we'll renew. It helps us streamline the bid process. Uh, if we're not satisfied with the service, then we go out to bid the second year. And we're doing that more and more with our uh, inspection services contracts. Um, we're continuously looking for ways to improve the efficiency of both our internal operations and some of the more centralized programs that we run. We're going to be looking at a new work order system. We're working with the IT department on that. Um, we just implemented a new copier program. We put in 15 new copiers across the city. Uh, we're working to try to get departments to realize that it's much more efficient and less costly to print to your copiers than it is to print to your printers. Um, so with new machines, we have a five-year lease, no maintenance cost for the five years. Um, so again, we're saving money and improving services and efficiency moving forward. Same with our office supply and custodial programs. We have both the school and city side centralized program we've had for years. Again, trying to improve the bidding and the costing of our supplies and how people are ordering and using them efficiently, as efficiently as possible. Um, we just renewed our, uh, for another three years, our trash contract with alternative recycling. This is for all city buildings uh, and the schools. Uh, we have uh, a new three-year contract with no price increase from alternative recycling. So they'll be continuing trash service uh, and recycling and some composting services at the schools uh, for the same price for another three fiscal years. Um, on the parking side, um, again, small, small increase in the uh, dollar amount between fiscal 17 and 18 in the budgets. Uh, last year, we added a maintenance assistant to the parking maintenance staff. 
This is the position that used to be funded under the bid. Uh, Tom, as you've seen him working out on the streets, now works uh, for the city uh, in coordinating with the DNA. Uh, one guy doing a tremendous amount of work. Um, he's at work at 3 o'clock in the morning, five days a week, uh, four seasons a year. And uh, he does a tremendous job. Um, so he, his position will continue. Um, some of the other items you might have seen, um, small increases for repairs and maintenance. This is to cover some of the deferred maintenance we have uh, in the gear parking garage. These are projects that are too small to be bid as capital projects. Uh, I'll talk about the capital projects in a second. Um, and we continue to look at um, both implementing better uh, maintenance and operations with the garage parking system. Uh, that system has now been in place for two years. Uh, we're continually tweaking that. And um, well, that's all I'll say about the parking system. Um, just a couple of points about capital projects, and then I'll open it for questions. Um, we have an aggressive capital program that, that is already underway. Uh, we'll be doing more MSBA work on roofs at Bridge Street and Leeds Elementary this summer. Um, in fact, there was a walkthrough today for a pre-bid conference to get contractors to look at the buildings and give us pricing. Um, that work will be done probably mid-September. Uh, we have a whole host of other school-related capital projects that will be happening. Uh, we've got a, a number of city side capital projects and we'll be doing more work in the garage this summer. Not as aggressive as the last three or four years worth of work in the garage. Uh, some waterproofing, uh, basically uh, sealing everything that we've done all the aggressive work over the last four years. So that's a quick rundown and I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Councilor Dwight. Right. Um, <clears throat> recently we had a presentation at the uh, at the Energy and Sustainability Committee from Greenfield about uh, aggregate green power. Um, and the presentation included the fact that they can do competitive pricing. They, they can compete with um, anything that National Grid would pump out. Um, there are fluctuations, of course, in variables. Is this your experience, or do you, have you, have we considered or discussed anything further beyond this first uh, initial discussion about aggregate green power for the municipality? It's on, <coughs> it's on Chris Mason's agenda, Councillor. Uh, we've talked about it. We, we all went through this with, at, at the, uh, on the NESC uh, with the presentations and then the situation with Boston and looking at that and the cost-wise. It's something that Chris continues to monitor, um, but at this point, I don't have a lot of specifics on it. It's, it's not totally active at this point. And can I ask is some follow-ups on the, on the um, LEDs? Yes. Uh, there was a lot of uh, community conversation about the LEDs and their impacts and their experience. But one of the things that got kind of lost in the discussion was that at least there was a projected reduction of close to 71% consumption and uh, about a 51% reduction in ambient light and light uh, pollution mm -hmm. is that been the experience now since since the uh, since the system's been implemented? So I know Chris is monitoring and actually uh, going out and doing light level readings. Um, every time he's gotten a request to come out and look at a particular light in a particular location, he'll go out and he'll use a, do a foot candle assessment. Um, we've had a couple of situations I think where we've actually gone in and, and installed shields. Uh, which became part of the, the whole process. And there's a form that uh, a citizen can fill out and it gets reviewed. And there have been some shields that have been installed. But Chris is watching it. And my feeling is that based on the number of positive comments that Chris has gotten from people about what, what the cost savings are and what the consumption decreased is and how there's no resulting discussion about, yes, but it's so bright, or yes, it's uh, too bright. Um, I think it was the right move to make, and uh, there really hasn't been a lot of backlash about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor? Is there an update on um, 
changing the downtown or implementing a system in the in on Main Street essentially for uh, credit card payments or app payments for parking? Mayor, you want to address that? Yeah, it's a multi-department uh, project that's not just the parking, uh, not just central services. We've got three different departments uh, working on it because we've got basically three different systems we have to marry together. Um, we're currently looking at um, probably uh, June until the system um, gets <coughs> fully implemented. There's a hardware issue with um, building, uh, getting the new internal hardware for the kiosks that, that you know David and his shop will work on. Um, the um, the uh, treasurer collector's office had to also rebid or had to renew its contract for the handheld PEO devices, which have to be able to communicate um, to that. And then we're also working on a third contract with an app vendor, um, uh, Park Mobile, um, which is, has to then talk to the other two, and they all have to talk to each other. So we're um, it got pretty complicated, and we are um, working on. Actually, reviewing screen the LED screen shots that, that the language of all the screenshots. So we feel like we're in good shape, um, and actually we're we're thinking that the implementation will be at a good time of the summer, probably close to you know end of you know, Fourth of July ish or end of the end of June time frame when people will be um, you know it'll be a, a quieter time. Let's just put it that way. Um, for us to get out and get all that work done. So that's the update, and um, we're looking forward to it. We think it's going to be a really um, successful system. Mm -hmm. yep. Working our way around, Councilors, anything? Councilor Bidwell. Uh, when, when you refer to the, the, the mix of green and brown sources for electricity, what, 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 are, what are our current percentages? Do you, do you have an idea of the green versus brown? Sorry, I, I meant to grab the information on the mix when I came over, and uh, I don't have it, but I, I can certainly, or Chris will get that to you. I'd just be curious what it is and how it compares to peer communities and sort of. Or, or there, is, it, there or is, is a there national is a or mix, a state yeah. average, for example. I'll, I'll get that for you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Councillors, councillors, Councillor Klein, no, Councillor Barch. You're up. Um, could you just give me a little update on the landfill on Glendale Road with the solar array? So the installation is almost totally complete. Um, again, the, the DPW and Chris have been monitoring that project. We're at a point now where the paperwork and the interconnection agreements are wending their way through Boston and the DPU. I think that's the latest and the, almost the last step until everything goes live. I want to thank you and your department for working tirelessly. And I'm really impressed to see on the LD, LED lights. I have not had any complaints about the LED lights so far in Ward 6. I don't know about if you have. But to hear about the rebate, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so, Councillor Dwight indicates we don't have any online questions or any text questions. Anyone in, that's in the live audience here have any questions on the central services budget? Seeing no one, thank you, Mr. Pomerantz, right. for coming to join us. Thank you all. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. So, next up, we have Chief, Chief Nichols. I see him in the back of the room from the fire department to do the uh, fire rescue budget. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Thank you. give you an, an overview of uh, our budget for this coming year here. Uh, basically, the fire rescue de uh, department, uh, we provide basically fire rescue and EMS service to the city. Uh, basically, our budget uh, for this coming year increased 2.74% uh, over last year. Uh, the majority of that is basically uh, personal services, which was contractual raises uh, where we set all the contract, and just a slight raise in our uh, uh, slight increase in our OM budget uh, out through there. Uh, basically, there's no reduction in staff or <coughs> services that we're going to provide out there. Uh, we're still going to staff with 68 uniformed people to do our job uh, out of both stations up there. And to give you some of the highlights uh, from FY17 that we've done, uh, through contractual bargaining, uh, we eliminated what we always had, uh, what we called the impact shift, where when we started into the EMS uh, service for the city uh, as a sole provider, uh, it was really to cover peak periods, uh, which was 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And through collective bargaining with the, the local, uh, we were able to eliminate that. 
Uh, we did that because basically the service need for the city uh, was that great that we needed to have three ambulances around the clock. Uh, when we had that, basically we provided three ambulances during the daytime and at nighttime we went to two ambulances. Uh, but call volume has increased so much that basically we needed to really provide those three ambulances around the clock. And through collective bargaining, we're able to uh, uh, eliminate that, put those four people that were on the impact shift on 24 hour shifts, uh, and thus we're able to provide basically three ambulances 24 seven to the city, uh, along with uh, two fully staffed engine companies out there. Uh, another, another highlight that we did for the city is uh, through the Affordable Care Act, there's a reimbursement called CPE program. Uh, basically, that's uh, a little bit of kickback from Medicare. Uh, so when we do services, uh, provide services to people with Medicare, uh, basically they'll kick back a little bit to municipal ambulance services. Uh, my deputy chief of EMS, John Garapy, has done a tremendous amount of work uh, pulling data together. He's worked with Susan Wright uh, because they need to know all your expenditures, personal services, maintenance on trucks, what's it cost, and uh, it's pretty detailed out there. Uh, I'm happy to say that we should be getting back uh, $94,000 in that reimbursement. Uh, and that's a lot of work to uh, Deputy Garapy for pulling that together and making that work. Uh, just to give you a quick update on our billing company, uh, we transitioned two years ago over to Comstar. Uh, this does our EMS billing for the service that we provide out there. Uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, we've been working really closely with them. Uh, basically, our collection rate is about 93% in the city. Uh, that's uh, really unheard of. I uh, actually have a meeting with them tomorrow. Uh, there isn't many communities across the state that has such a high reimbursement rate uh, for getting money from insurance companies for the service that we provide. Uh, some, some of that was we instituted a better CQ&I program, uh, which is basically quality control. Uh, that really led to kind of us doing some report writing and, and things like that for our people <coughs> to help us document the calls better, uh, which helps the billing and uh, process there and getting that back quicker. Uh, some of the other projects that we've covered uh, this year, uh, our new station alerting, uh, I think you've probably seen that. I know it was covered in the newspaper and uh, on TV quite a bit. Uh, it's really a station alerting system that alerts our people to a call. The kind of the neat thing about that is, is basically when the dispatcher takes a, a 911 call or a phone call for service, as soon as they start entering information into the CAD system, uh, it, it automatically alerts the firefighters. It's a, it's a computer generated voice. It gives us just a generic kind of call nature what it is. But the great thing to that is it, it basically increases our response time. Gets our people moving to our apparatus and gets them out the door quicker and uh, hopefully to the, uh, the scene of the emergency in a, in a quick fashion out there. Uh, just, I love facts. Uh, one of the things we have is uh, our response time in the city, which this is for, uh, Florence, Leeds, downtown. Uh, we average five minutes uh, from time of leaving the station uh, to getting to the scene, which in some of the remote areas, I think that's pretty good. Uh, downtown, certainly a little bit quicker, but it, it's kind of a neat fact that we have out there. Uh, We've also transitioned to using uh, tablets, uh, basically out in the field for inspections. Uh, we, we transitioned that, started that about two years ago. One of the neat things with that is, is we're out in the field as we do the inspections. Uh, basically, we're entering the data. We don't have to go back to the station and do time consuming of data entry in there. It's done right when we're out into the field. And thus, with that, we're also building out our database uh, with our emergency reporting system. So we're collecting data, getting it done in a more efficient way, and better use of our guys' time when they're out in the field. And uh, that's worked very well for us. A few glitches on the technology end, but I think we've got that pretty well worked out. Uh, just some other things, door access system. Uh, a couple of these, I have to give a lot of thanks to David Pomerantz and Central Services uh, for helping us kind of work our way through that. Uh, but door access system, the old system we had, which is kind of the security system in the station, uh, was failing. We couldn't get any more parts. Basically, if any of the hardware broke, uh, we, we'd be out of luck. Uh, but we were able to secure money with that. And uh, basically, this winter, we've got the new system installed, which base, uh, provides a better access and security for the system out there. Uh, one of the things we did secure this year was uh, a small grant, and we ended up buying bulletproof vests. Uh, I hate to kind of say that uh, first responders out there, one of the things we really got to be concerned about is the safety for us as we go. And uh, we looked at it a few years ago and kind of identified uh, just with society out there. I know we had the bombing in England yesterday. Uh, in Chelsea, they had a, uh, an individual who barricaded himself inside a house and started it on fire. And actually, a friend of mine out there was texting me pictures where that firefighters were fighting the fire with SWAT team members uh, covering them, which is kind of unique and, and different out there. But 
I was glad we bought the vests. Uh, we were able to purchase eight of them, and that's able to provide at least a level of protection uh, for our people. And one of the big things that I'm very happy about is we ordered a new fire engine. Uh, basically, that should be coming in probably October, November. And with that, uh, it's got a new compressed air foam system on it. Uh, basically, that's technology that uses foam to make an extinguishing agent. And probably the easiest way to explain it is it takes your water and extends it out three times. This truck will have 1,000 gallons of water. With the foam system that's on there, we'll get 3,000 gallons of extinguishing agent, uh, which in the Florence and Leeds area, which doesn't have a municipal water system, should be a useful tool for our people. It's not the end all, but it's, it's another technology use that hopefully will be beneficial if we have a fire out in that area. Uh, and some of the goals and highlights for uh, FY18, looking at a new rescue boat. Uh, basically, the one we have is an old government surplus. Uh, it certainly it needs a lot of repair. It's uh, old military. Parts are hard to come by. And uh, basically, with that, we we're, we're, should be able to secure a new rescue boat, which will provide a very good platform for our people on the river. Uh, as you see in the Connecticut River, there's a lot of activity out there now, and uh, this should work very well for us. Uh, we're going to buy two new 12-lead uh, monitors. Uh, this is just to keep technology current for our people providing emergency medical care out there. And uh, we're certainly looking to explore uh, opportunities with new technology, which will help with us provide uh, pre-hospital care for patients. Uh, and uh, we're going to continue with our pre-fire plan program. Uh, we started that slow. Uh, to get into that, but again, as I say, our database that we're working on, that we're getting all our information into, we're slowly working into that. Doing the inspections, getting the information added into the field, that's helping, but we really want to kind of start into kind of doing some pre-fire plans of some of the bigger target are areas uh, in the city that would help us out. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll open up to questions. Sure, Councilor Barge, we'll let yes. you be up first. Um, 7,033 emergency incidents that's an increase from last year yes every year we're seeing an increase in there uh, of our call volume uh, and the majority of it uh, basically it's almost like 70 percent of our calls are EMS so it, it is going up every year and uh, it, it's just what we have to deal with I want to thank you and your department again okay I mean you know what you need for your department to save people's lives and to me, I'll always support what is needed for a fire department or a police department for saving people's lives. Thank you. And I want to thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Work our way around, uh, Council uh, Dwight. Uh, <clears throat> 25 structure fires. Does that include the most recent? So that, that, uh, that, that was for 2016. Okay. So it'd be, it'd be January to December of 2016. How's it looking this year? Uh, this year, it, it's a little bit slow. Uh, but what we've had is this kind of the dollar loss is up there a little bit higher with that. We had recent Graves Avenue fire. Uh, right. And what we're seeing is just home prices are, are going up. Uh, so that increases the fire damage, as Councilor Murphy knows. Right. So, the, so the final bill is more expensive. But I mean, the, yep. the amount of call, <clears throat> the responses you guys are doing to structure fires historically has dropped. Because Correct. Of, uh, mm -hmm. Because of prevention systems and, and the like. And, yep. <clears throat> and and the outreach that the fire department's done and then but you see correspondingly you're seeing the ems responses going up yes right? yep yeah we're, we're we're currently seeing and and for some reason this week it's been kind of a, a phenomenon out there that we get four or five ambulance calls within like an hour uh and, and then it, it slow for a while and they kind of come in that way but I, I think it's just society is is a general that people are more adapt to call 911 when they need some help and and are, are willing to do that and that's why we're seeing the increase in call volume basically every year in in Duane, uh also historically the overtime line on for the fire department's always been be, because of the variables that you guys are facing and stuff how's how's overtime looking this year uh, the, the overtime this year is looking good uh, I feel very confident that we'll make it through this year and uh, going into next year I, I feel comfortable that that we should be okay and I always throw the caveat in there uh, that you know if something big happened uh, you know we, we may have to relook at that but I, I'm confident this year we'll do well I'm sure Susan's glad to hear that in the mayor uh, and next year like I say you know barring a, a, a big major incident uh, I, I think we'll do very well with that also 
did Round Hill count as a big major incident? Uh, that was a major incident <laughs> for us. Uh, that was very big. It's the <laughs> so, biggest I've seen in, in decades. Here. Yeah, that, that was one of the bigger fires I've seen in my career here. So uh, unfortunately, nobody got hurt. And, uh, you know, we're, we're able to at least save the uh, occupied side of the structure there. The, the guys did a great job with that. That was all on them. They did an excellent job. Mm -hmm. Working with Councilor I, I, I was going to mention the Round Hill fire. Um, I, 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 in, in the weeks following, I heard nothing but praise from, from folks, including those that were really severely impacted. Thank you. Uh, uh, about the performance of, of your department, police and building inspection. It was, it was, it was a huge event. And we're all, it's not, it's not just luck. It was a lot of good, good, good professional attention that, that got us out of that. So my, 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 my compliments again. Thank you. I mean, one, one of the neat things that, that I'm really happy about that I, I think we have a great relationship between police, fire, and building, and uh, I, I've never seen an emergency scene work so smoothly, I think, in the last couple of years, that uh, it, it's, we all know our role, we know how to support one another, and uh, we do a great job with that. So I, I would thank you for your praise, and, and I also commend the police and building departments for, for their assistance on these scenes, too. And then I had a, a, a very quick unrelated question. When, 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 when you talk about the, the call volume that's necessitated going to three units, three ambulance units around the clock, how, how much of that is opioid uh, related? Uh, I, I don't have part? the exact figures on that. I, I mean, it's interesting that uh, we, we attended a forum uh, a couple of weeks ago on that uh, and what police have for data and what we have for data. Because what we, we call overdoses, it's not only opiates, but it could be medication overdoses and, and other things like that. So our numbers are, are kind of look bigger, but we don't categorize out, we don't spell out the opiates. But that's a, that's a huge thing in society out there today. Uh, that's a concern for us. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing is fentanyl, uh, where they're cutting the heroin uh, basically with that. And uh, we're seeing across the, uh, the country where first responders going in to help someone who is overdosed uh, are basically getting overdosed themselves because they're getting contaminated, uh, whether it's on their skin or inhaling it, uh, basically ODing while they're doing their service. So it's, it's a big concern for us, and, and uh, uh, it's one of those things going forward that we're really paying a lot of attention to and want to take care of our people. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor O'Donnell. Can I just ask a very, it's probably a technical question, but I just don't know what this is. Working out of grade, 31,000, yeah. that's it's a personnel? Ba basically thing. with that, what we have is a rank structure on a shift is we have a deputy chief, and then we have a captain in each station. Right. Uh, working out of grade is, uh, when we don't have to hire, we get to a minimum level. Uh, a firefighter may step up to a captain, or a captain may step up to a deputy chief's role. So they, they kind of work a temporary period yeah, of just for a temporary months. shift period. Uh, right. So they work ab above their class, and okay. they're compensated for that. Yeah. So in the police department, there was a working out of class line, and so maybe for the city council we can have working without class or something. <laughs> but not, thank you. I was just I assume I voted for this before. I just didn't know what the yeah. term. Oh, was. that's so. that's a fair question. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, council scare. Um, Chief, the eight vests that you said you purchased, are those are they sufficient for the amount of call volume that you're talking about? Right, right now they are. Uh, I know in my capital plan two years out, uh, I have uh, some money allocated uh, to probably purchase some more. Uh, but right now, uh, I think this is what basically what it does is it gets uh, all my EMS people uh, and the first due engine uh, at least some protection if we get to a scene that uh, is volatile uh, that we need to protect ourselves. Uh, I, I hope, I really hope that in my career I never have to see our people use those, but I, I felt it was an option that we really needed to look at and provide. And, uh, and I have a question, one that, that kind of applies to you and, and also to Chief Castro when she gets here. I noticed that you have a couple of vacancies, a couple of three vacancies. Yep. And one of the ways both in police and fire we control over time is by having a full department so that there's a regular time person for, for every so, shift. So, so two, of the, two of those vacancies were uh, retirements and mm -hmm. one was a resignation. Uh, and actually uh, early in June I have two more people retiring. And with that, we've completed the hiring process. And mid-June, we're going to bring five new individuals onto the department to uh, bring us up to full staff. Mm -hmm. And it's great because I know both with, with your department and Chief Casper's department, the time from hire to actually taking a role in a shift with the training yeah. is, it takes a while. So we, you know, it's too bad we can't stay a little ahead of the game. Yeah, we, we continually try. Uh, it's a challenge. 
Uh, and believe it or not, there is actually a, a sh kind of a shortage of paramedics uh, out there. And uh, so, so we're trying to keep ahead of it. Uh, one of my deputy chiefs, uh, Stephen Oss, kind of runs the hiring process for me, and, and he's, believe it or not, is continually working on it. Mm -hmm. uh, he's working with HR, and uh, I think we're going to be out advertising probably this summer to collect applications again to try to keep up and keep ahead of the game. But at this point, um, the, the vacancies that are on the books now or foreseeable, uh, the hires are in place to fill those. Yes, yes, they're, Excellent. they'll be starting early June. Uh, they'll cover those three vacancies and the two vacancies so with the retirements that we'll have in June. Excellent. So, uh, Councilor, you say there's no one, no, no, no email, no anyone uh, that's physically in the room have any questions for Chief Nichols on the fire department budget? No, going once, going to any more questions for up here? Excellent. Thank you, Chief. Thank, Thank you. you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> and, uh, we go from one chief uh, to another chief. Chief Casper is here, and we're time to uh, to look at the police department budget. So, good evening, Chief Casper. Welcome. Good evening. Nice to see you all. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'll point out a few changes to the budget. Our budget is very consistent to the FY17 budget, uh, with a few slight differences. Uh, we're very excited that we settled our contract. So, of course, our You'll note a salary increase for everyone as a result of our three-year contract that we just signed. Also, you may recall or seen in the news that we have a new uh, administrative and community outreach sergeant, that's Corey Robinson. We didn't get a whole new position, but we transitioned an officer into that supervisory role uh, because, frankly, the amount of administrative work that we have uh, was burdening our, our other supervisors and not allowing them to go out onto the street and do their job. So we created this position so we could kind of take that heavy administrative uh, load and put it onto him. So he's taken that, but you'll notice that change. He started in January, so he's been in that position already. Also the vehicle budget, uh, you may notice an increase on the cost per vehicle. Uh, one of the biggest cost differences per vehicle was that, as it turns out, the SUVs uh, have a different uh, repair history than the Crown Vicks, i.e. they break down a little bit more. Um, so we got a warranty, an extended warranty, which was about $2,000 per vehicle. Our fleet manager recommended that because we were spending more than that on vehicle repairs. So that uh, accounts for the largest chunk of that difference. Uh, also, you may note that we have the part-time ACO on there. So we have the full-time animal control officer position. I never like to have any position where we don't have someone who is cross-trained, who doesn't know how to do the job, particularly a job like the animal control officer. Um, that's an important job, and if, if she were to become sick or injured and we needed someone to fill in, we really wanted to have someone cross-trained to do that. So we have a, I'll call it part-time, but it's less than part-time hours. She works just a few hours a week uh, just to kind of keep her head in the game and know how to do the job so that when our full-time ACO uh, Shayla Howe is out of town or on vacation or at a training or for any other reason can't work, we can have the second person step in and take over that job. So you'll see that small amount on there for 16000 to cover her. Those are really the changes from the uh, <coughs> teen budget. Uh, a few challenges I just want to point out that certainly have an impact on our budget. Uh, the political climate, uh, I don't know if anyone's noticed, it's different. Uh, and I would say maybe a little unstable, and it has resulted in a variety of changes in our community. So we have a lot more protesting, a lot more uh, marches, and a lot more large-scale gatherings, and those result in additional costs for our police department regarding traffic, security, uh, kind of also if we have people come into our community who are higher profile, uh, involved in government, we have additional security concerns that we may not have had a few years ago, uh, but we have kind of a heightened uh, awareness of our climate and, and potential threats. So those events cost more money to manage. Uh, also, uh, addiction, which is something we've all been dealing with for a very long time. We continue to deal with that. We're working on a lot of front end solutions. Uh, we're you know, very involved with Hampshire Hope. We have our, our DART officers are out there uh, identifying people who have overdose and trying to get them into substance uh, recovery and other services. So we continue to not only deal with, you know, try to assist people who struggle with addiction, but also we deal with the crimes that they may ultimately commit, property crimes, breaking and entering into cars or businesses in order to support that habit. So it impacts us in many different ways. Um, last year, you may recall, we had 51 suspected overdoses. Those are overdoses just that we responded to at the police. 
Police Department. There may have been others that we did not respond to because we were never called or we didn't know about them or they went right to the hospital. Uh, but we responded to 51. Uh, this year so far, we've responded to 22. So we're just about right on par with where we were last year. Uh, and Chief Nichols did mention that, you know, we're seeing heroin mixed in with, fentanyl mixed in with heroin, so we're seeing some changes in the drugs that are out there. Um, also, uh, technology, just in general, if I think about what kind of technology existed in our building when I was hired 20 years ago and where we are now, <laughs> it's a lot more. Uh, and the technology that we have includes both software and hardware. So that kind of equipment requires yearly contracts, constant replacement, training to know how to use it. Uh, it's, most of it is critical to the way that we do our jobs. It's become commonplace. If we didn't have it, it would be a lot of learning. <laughs> We've become very reliant on it. Um, but there's always new software to keep us up on all the different tasks uh, that we have. Uh, also, we're always working on community relations, trust, and accountability. There's been a lot, of course, uh, we all know this in our community, around immigration, sanctuary cities, race relations. So we've done a lot of work with training and education, having our officers, myself, involved in different community discussions, panels. Uh, so that's certainly something that we're constantly working on. Uh, hiring and attracting new people to the field, although I'm pleased to report in my exciting section at the end labeled good news, I'll tell you that we're fully staffed. Uh, but nonetheless, we always like to plan ahead. As you folks pointed out, it does take a while to get from doing an interview to actually having someone who can work alone. It can be anywhere from eight months to a year, kind of depending on things. So we have noticed a decrease in the number of people applying to work on our police department, but that is a consistent trend across the Commonwealth and across the nation. Just less people want to be police officers. You know, there's a lot of police officers in the news and <laughs> there's a lot of criticism of the way that, you know, police officers do their jobs. Um, so, you know, I can understand an 18 or 19 or 20 year old maybe being, choosing a different career path. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, something that might be a little less controversial. Uh, so we're seeing that, as I said, it is consistent, but we spend a good amount of time trying to uh, recruit people who are local, who want to be here, who understand our community dynamics and who want to make a long-term commitment to us. Uh, finally, just in our list of ongoing challenges, traffic issues, always a challenge for us. Yes, we have speeders, we've talked about that, and there are <coughs> concerns around our city in different areas that we continue to address. Uh, but beyond that, you know, impaired operators, distracted driving are major issues that we're always trying to deal with. We continue to have a high number of impaired operators on our streets uh, by both drugs and alcohol. We have a lot of people texting and Facebooking and emailing while they're driving. Um, and those con continue to be problematic in motor vehicle accidents. And certainly in our community, a heightened concern because of the high number of pedestrians that we have. So that's just an overview of kind of the things that are on my front burner. I left off my back burner list. It's long. Um, for stats, you have most of this data in front of you. Uh, in general, as I said, we are fully staffed. I think it's the first time we've been fully staffed in about 15 or 20 years. So we're very excited at that. Um, there is a Massachusetts State Police Academy coming up and we do sometimes have candidates from our department who opt to go to the state police. Um, that could happen, we don't know, uh, but for now we're fully staffed, so I'm glad this meeting is today and I can tell you that and then I don't know, you never know tomorrow. Um, we handled around 41,000 calls in calendar year last year. If you look back in 2006, we handled about 28,000 calls, so it's gone up quite a bit. Uh, we took 3,000 580 offense reports, uh, 448 domestic violence. We had about 1,000 arrests, which is pretty much on par with years past. Uh, as I mentioned before about impaired operators, we had 140 uh, impaired operator arrests. Interestingly, about 4% of those were for OUI drugs. We're certainly keeping an eye on, on if that may be impacted with medical marijuana, with recreational marijuana, and if we'll see any sort of change in those numbers. But for now, it's at about 4%. Our department was recognized in 2016 by MAD for um, Mothers Against Drunk Driving for the enforcement of impaired operators that came out and gave the Midnight Shift an award. We're very proud of the work that they're doing out there. Uh, they've written nearly 5,000 citations as well. And we had about 585 motor vehicle collisions. That is always impacted by weather. We did not have a lot of snow this year, so therefore that was a little bit down from years before. 
We registered 152 sex offenders. We processed 214 licenses to carry for firearms. So those are just a quick overview of some interesting numbers uh, about our activity. As far as some good news, as I mentioned, our contracts are settled. I like that. Uh, accreditation, you may recall or you may not, that in 2002, we're only the sixth police department in the Commonwealth to become accredited. Uh, and we are up for reaccreditation again uh, in a week or two. They'll be in doing uh, the assessment, so we're bracing ourselves for that. Uh, also in 2016, we joined the White House Police Data Initiative, and we've been working on transparency with our data. That has been a really valuable tool. We've gotten a lot of accolades for that from all over the place. So you may recall um, my captain and I were down in Washington, D.C., and had the opportunity to present some of our data at the White House, so it was pretty nice. And we continue to get a lot of calls and people write about the way that we ran that program because we involve the citizens in that and we have really unique and interesting data. I use it all the time. Whenever I need to know a number, I go onto it. I refer, people call me and ask me, oh, I need this data. It's already on there. So it's been a good tool for us for reducing the work that we have to do when people call because it's all already there. So I like that. Retention is doing really well. We lost zero officers so far in 2017. And last year we only lost three, and two of those were full retirements, which is always how we want to see someone go. We always want to have someone have a nice long career with us. Um, so, I mean, before in some years past, we've lost as many as 10 and 9 and 5, so we were losing some high numbers. Those are very costly numbers to lose uh, for a variety of reasons, even beyond the financial cost, but just the impact that has on the department. So our retention is excellent. Our firing range is nearly done. We're very excited. It's looking great. I walk down there daily to check on it. <laughs> it's doing well. Uh, we've done a lot with community outreach efforts. I'm sure you've noticed a lot of our efforts uh, covered in either social media or in the news. We have fishing derbies. We have we had police day. We have a lot of community liaison officers. We've been very busy in lots of different ways in that. I mentioned our DART program. They've been very busy uh, working with people who uh, have overdosed. They reach out to them and try to connect them to services, so they've been well. Uh, training, we have been very busy training our officers as well. We averaged about 138 hours of training per officer last year, which is a really high number for our police department. I can't give you a comparison statistic, but I can tell you that it's high. So we're very proud of the em emphasis that we're putting on training. We have a training coordinator who is excellent at finding inexpensive or free training, which is one of my favorites, uh, and still really good quality. So we're doing well there. We're continuing to work on diversifying our staff. Uh, I can tell you that there was a, a time uh, well before 2015, out of our department of 65 police officers, there were only three women. Uh, so since February 2015, uh, we've had 12 people that are still with our department hired since then, and uh, five of them are women, so that's a lot for us. We're pretty excited about that. Uh, DB staffing, we've rotated a position into the Detective Bureau, so the Detective Bureau has some additional support and it also provides kind of a bridge between patrol and investigations. Um, so we've got a lot of things going on. We're, we're a busy place. Uh, in general, the staff is fantastic. I feel lucky to work with one of the best police departments. I, I can't say enough good things. Um, they're I always ask them, do you mind doing this? Can you do this? Do you want to be a liaison? Will you be on this board, this executive committee? They continue to do it, and I don't pay them anymore. Uh, but they're great about it, and they're involved in their own personal communities as well, being youth coaches and you know, involved in their schools and volunteerism and all that. So really a great group of people. I feel lucky to work with them. That's an overview of my budget. So we'll start on this side and come around this way this time. Questions uh, on this side? <coughs> Councillor, um, I'm sorry. Did you want oh, to go ahead, Councillor Scare? Can you give a little bit more of a detailed update on the uh, firing range? Yes, uh, the firing range. So we have put in. There's been two major components of it. There's an air wall that we put in the back, uh, which draws the air through the range, and then there is a um, all the equipment that's in the range, things that we shoot at and baffles and tiles and all that sort of thing. We have run into a snag with part of the ventilation system that we're working on remedying. <laughs> we should have answers on that soon, but right now it's a snag. Um, so we'll see what happens, but we're optimistic that it will still be finished soon. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell. If you had a, I believe you have one speed trailer, right? I do. Okay. If yes. you had more, could you use them effectively? I feel like the, I, I don't have information, <laughs> but I feel like 
they're effective? That's a great question. Uh, yes, so speed trailers, ideally, I think if we put, I don't know why people keep speeding. I ask myself this. I can't fall asleep at night sometimes wondering why assume you talk stop to speeding. Just yeah. ask them. We write a lot of tickets. We pull over a lot of people. There's a lot of community involvement and say, stop speeding. People make signs. People stand on the street. We do a lot of things, but people just keep speeding. Um, so yeah, we put signs out, and that does have an impact on streets. Uh, we have one that we got quite a long time ago. Right. I actually just purchased a new sign uh, that is not as big as a trailer, but it has the exact same function. I like it because it's small. It's mm -hmm. very easy. It's not on a big trailer. We don't need to hook it onto a tow hook. Uh, you just grab it, and you can put it up on a sign and uh, have it be in a community. So this one will be a little bit easier to move around uh, as the demand. We, you know, We have always demands in the summer for people who want this on their streets. I know Cardinal Way. Yes. Cardinal Way. This is a perfect sign for Cardinal Way. Uh, but we have a number of streets that are just kind of frequent flyers in our yeah. complaint area. So I think the okay. sign will be really good for moving around, but I do think it has an impact. So now you have two. You haven't retired the other one. You haven't. No, we're going to keep plugging one that one around. It's really big. Right. It runs on really big batteries. It's old. Okay. I mean, it's. I, I think it's like around 15 years old, but I can't be sure. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yep. So. Uh, Council Carney. Oh, uh, my question was, I know it's in the uh, capital improvement plan, mm -hmm. but what's the projected timeline for the animal control facility? <laughs> I, I would classify it as up in the air right now. Uh, okay. I, I can't say. We're working on, we've certainly talked about it, and we're working on s different site ideas. So okay. that's where we so are. We're in the infancy stage. It's not yeah, toddler maybe. I mean, we've yeah, been talking okay. about it a while, so yeah. <laughs> but we don't, we don't have a good firm site yet. Yep. Councilor Pedro, did you have a question as we move on from Councilor Joy? Uh, <clears throat> more of a statement. Uh, I actually very much appreciate the nuanced understanding of shifting times and shifting circumstances uh, without overreacting, but at the same time being proactive. And it's become a hallmark of this department, and I just felt it's worth noting, citing, and commending. So, thanks. Thank you. Councilor mm -hmm. Klein, do you have any questions for the chief? Councilor, well, actually, we'll let Councilor Barge go. Councilor Nash has just arrived and he's getting settled, so Councilor Barge. Um, I want to thank you and your department. And to be honest with you, I would not want to be a police officer today. So you're not going to be on our recruiting list? I <laughs> not you're not out. <laughs> but I want to thank your department. And I think you should be prepared because there's going to be many more marches that are going to come forth. <laughs> the way this world is going and what's happening in Washington has made many people upset again. And you're going to find more and more of your budget with overtime. All the cities. But I thank you. You're welcome. Um, Councilor Nash, now that you've settled in, do you have any questions for? Not at this time. <laughs> Can I just um, ask Councilor Nash to, uh, you know, certify he didn't speed on his way from Ohio? <laughs> <laughs> My kids were driving. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank well, I can guarantee, you know, the, the, the ships are doing a good job. You wouldn't have made it here. Once you hit the city line, they would have got you if you were speeding. I, know well, I was hoping the mayor's chopper could come to yeah. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, and and I, I just wanted to uh, point out, you know, one of the reasons we talk about the range is when the police department had to leave site to train, it often involved scheduling and overtime, and, it, you know, it was an expensive process. The state, they didn't, they doubled the number of shooting days they have to spend. So it was getting expensive, and now that we get the system set up, it, it'll be a better system in the building, and they can train around their shifts that should cut down on some overtime. So it, it was an important addition to the station because of the scheduling flexibility that it adds and the different options and training that it adds. It's a pretty sophisticated facility, not to mention that it finally, you know, we can finally close the book on the, on the construction of the new facility. But I think it'll be great that it'll, it'll, the training opportunities will increase, the trading overtime for firearms will decrease, and it'll be better training because it'll be a high-tech facility. Um, so, uh, Councilor, do you have any online questions for Chief Casper? No. Nope. says no. Nope. How about uh, folks present in the room? Does anybody here have a question for Chief Casper relative to her budget? Please come, come up and... Uh, yeah, give us your name and address and ask your question, and then let the chief come back and answer. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Amber Abdella. I live at 245 Main Street, right above Viva Pasta and across the street from the park. So I suppose my question relates to, have you noticed an increase of incidents now that the park has been revamped um, in terms of the crosswalk traffic, as well as perhaps have you considered increasing the officers in the late night beat throughout Pulaski Park? I have a little dog. I'm constantly in the park and I'm constantly walking uh, back and forth and I've noticed that people, I'm a little nervous as I cross and you were saying incidences in speeding, uh, perhaps we could make a bigger sign. I don't know if this is a cross question with the mayor, with public works, but the one little crosswalk sign is not sufficient. It is kind of scary. I noticed, I witnessed a dog get hit. So I carry my little dog across the street. <laughs> and late night, I do notice there is some little bit scary riffraff um, and not too much of a police presence. Mm -hmm. This is a safe community. I feel generally very safe. <laughs> but I am curious, now that the park is more popular um, mm -hmm. and clean and really nice, mm -hmm. if perhaps you might send some officers through late night as well. Thank you. Think, try, think. And relate, try and relate that to the budget, Chief. No problem. <laughs> Everything's about the budget. Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. I've been told I'm supposed to face this way, but That's I heard cool. you I'm and I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the park has been, I love the park, uh, certainly we, I, I think the, the climate of the park has changed quite a bit in a very positive way. It's opened up in there, the lighting is better, uh, and there's a lot of people who go in there to stop and have their ice cream or have a snack or eat. And I think in general, the climate of the park already, I've noticed anyway, uh, an improvement in, in how people feel walking through the park, just chatting with folks and kind of watching it myself. Um, we haven't had any incidents in the park of significance that I can think of. Uh, we're just coming into the, the warmer weather. Uh, but the park in general has been, it's a, a great place, very safe for dogs and people, uh, and uh, you know, we'll, I don't anticipate any major problems as we open up that back area with the new sidewalk that's going down. Uh, I think the changes that ha have gone into place in the park have made it a, a much better open, safe place. As far as the crosswalk goes, um, we, that's not a crosswalk that we in general have had a lot of incidents on, uh, not to say that cars always stop. <laughs> <laughs> but we haven't in general. I think there's a, a good line of sight there and, and a, a, some, it's hard to not talk to her when she asks a question. But um, <laughs> um, so yeah, and we do have a sign out there, I believe, right? Is there a pedestrian sign in the middle? There is in the middle. Yeah. Um, people do zoom by. Yes, and that's Very one of those things that I fall asleep yeah. at night thinking about is why people don't stop at crosswalks. But I do get that uh, certainly, you know, lighting and design factors always have an impact. So I'll keep that, that in mind. Thank you. You're so welcome. And one other one other number I want to compliment you on that was that was in your cover letter is that your your detectives have an 85 percent rate for solving right. the things that come across their desks, which they I do. think is which I think is excellent. They're uh, fantastic it's above the national average, and I know if most most of the people I've spoken to who have dealt with them said they're very compassionate and very committed to do what they do. Uh, provide good customer service to people who, if they've been victims of crime, are distressed, and I think they feel like they, they get attention and they get consideration, and and 85 percent of the time they get their crime solved. So it's a good deal. Yeah, they do a great job. Anything else for Chief Casper? Any other questions from the audience for Chief Casper? Okay, hearing none. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Happy thank you, thing. Chief. So we're a. A tad ahead of schedule here, but I see that Superintendent Provost is with us, expecting the schools to have uh, their share of questions. So why don't you uh, come up and join us? Welcome. Sorry. You have our largest budget, so we've got a little extra time to spend with you. So good evening. Thank you. Superintendent Provost, welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to this budget again. It's been a few months since I discussed it, so I may be a little rusty, but I spent some time reviewing it. And thanks for saving the best for last. Just to go over a few of the highlights, it's a $28,838,966 budget. It's an increase of 3.04% from last year. Uh, the main highlight that has been discussed at length in each of the individual buildings and um, in district-wide meetings and in the media is the elementary reorganization. 
It's um, a strategy that we have implemented several times actually in each of the last three budgets that I've been a part of, uh, of reallocating resources within the budget to try to address the needs we have. Um, one of the things that is challenging about creating a school budget is you're really trying to project ahead about 15 or 16 months and figure out where the schools will be at that time. And the budget is your one piece, your one opportunity in the school year to sort of put all your chess pieces on the board where you think you're going to be able to um, use them to best effect. So this year we had an elementary reorganization in which we reduced 23 ESPs in order to increase six and a half special education teachers. Um, this was um, accomplished without layoffs. We knew at the time that we did the reductions that we had eight separations coming up either through retirements or people moving to other jobs. And so we had created 15 positions for ESPs as building-based subs so that we could carry them forward without layoffs. We also did that knowing how high the turnover is in our ESP um, workforce that we would need all those people by the end of the year and instead of laying them off and then calling them back we figured it would be better for them and for us to keep them on board. Since the time the budget was passed three of the 15 have been assigned to permanent jobs because um, we've lost other ESPs in the district so now we're down to 12. Um, another important component of the budget is Math Investigations 3. It's a revamping of our elementary math curriculum. We currently do Math Investigations 2, which is a curriculum that really hasn't been adjusted to reflect the updates in the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks. Making the, um, making the update is costly because it's something that involves all four schools and involves all six grades. Um, so the materials cost of that is about $125,000. That um, is something that you all made possible by allowing the um, books to be included in the capital budget. So I want to thank you for that. Also, um, we're increasing our, or expanding our global STEM program. Probably read about global STEM in the Gazette last week. It's currently a program that we have at JFK and Jackson Street. Next year it will add a third site at Ryan Road. Um, students from both schools were actually involved in a 90-minute <coughs> conference with one of the NASA Mars scientists today, which they all found really amazing. You know, it's one thing to ask your teacher, will we ever have people on Mars? It's another thing to ask the people who are actually putting the plans in place to have people on Mars. Um, and so that's been, I think, a, a really motivating experience for our kids, and it's something that's really opening up new opportunities for them. And what I like best about it is the model um, is two schools from different countries working together with a science park. So there's a great deal of cultural exchange as well. Um, currently, we're working with a school in Coventry. Um, our hope is that we could expand to a school in India. Um, when you think of preparing kids, okay, so now we're not thinking 16 months down the road, but maybe 16 years down the road, and thinking of them for the kinds of opportunities that are going to be out there for them. I think it's important that we uh, get out of the North American sort of bubble, if you will. Um, and so I'm hoping that we have a connection with India next year. Definitely thinking that um, Asia is where the action will be for our students when they graduate. Um, and also hoping that we can get connected to the global south. Um, also in this budget, we increased sub rates to keep pace with, with minimum wage. And we're also increasing bandwidth, which is important, um, has really become an important aspect of programming at schools. As you all know, through prior capital projects, we um, implemented Wi-Fi wall to wall throughout the district. However, one of the things that we realized was even though our Wi-Fi network was very robust, the pipe they were getting out to the internet on wasn't wide enough. 
So um, we're looking at a tenfold increase in bandwidth next year. That's a cost of about $60,000. But if you're going to have students video conferencing with peers from across the ocean and, and other partners, we're finding that that's really an important tool for learning. So that's included in this. Um, this project or this budget does not include um, some money for refugee education. That's been sort of sequestered in a uh, supplemental possibility, which we've discussed with the mayor. And the reason for that is it, um, the refugee picture has been very uncertain. Um, windows open, people move in, windows close, all the movement stops. So far, uh, we haven't had any school-aged refugees. Um, we do have one who will be school-aged in two years. Uh, and we really, at this point in time, don't know whether or not we're going to have the ability to relocate refugees who are school age for next year. So we decided not to build that into the budget, but to take a wait and see uh, approach with the ability to come back for a supplemental possible funding if that becomes necessary. And then finally, I would just like to point out that much like the city has a stability <coughs> plan, we have stability plan in the school using our choice reserves um, as sort of our complement to the city's reserves. And we also are looking at a fiscal cliff that hits in FY21. So that's the budget in a nutshell, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And before we take questions, I'd just like to point out to everyone um, that there is a school committee <laughs> and that they are the ones that actually have control over line item things in the budget. That this, the city council deals with the total allocation to the school department the school committee deals with light item changes in the budget with decisions like implementing reorganization to the elementary schools. So this body, again, all we can do is cut the budget. We never cut the school budget. Um, so specific, you know, specific questions in this form about adding a teacher here or moving something there. This is not the proper venue for that since that's the bailiwick of the school committee and they work very hard at that. So uh, let me start, uh, we'll start with Councilor Lavarge this time and go around this way. Do you have any questions for the superintendent? Um, just looking at the budget itself, I feel that it's really not enough of money because you can tell. I mean, you did make some cuts, correct? We should get some questions. So how about the um, cooking teacher's position at the high school? Is that gone now? Is that eliminated? Yes, we decided not to continue that program. We kept the position at the high school. It actually was reduced somewhat. It was already a part-time position and we reduced it um, a little bit more because we had some other places in the, in the budget where we wanted to direct those funds. That, the remaining portion of that position will be used for special education because the high school is seeing that it has um, the, the same kind of changing needs that we've discussed with the rest of the schools. They're a little bit um, <coughs> further out on the wave, if you will, so it hasn't really come to the high school yet, but they're starting to see a change. And we also, um, we also just looked at what we were able to provide within the culinary arts program at the high school. And it was, not to, not to make a pun, but it was just sort of a taste of what was available. And you know, for kids who really want to have a strong culinary arts experience, there's Smith Vogue, and we can't replicate that. Yeah. We didn't want to try to replicate that. We felt that we could use the resources better for some of the needier kids coming to high school. Okay, Councilor Nash, you're settled in now. Do you have any questions for the Superintendent? Well, I, I just want to say, and I, I said this the other day on the radio with the mayor, that I, I'm so impressed that here we are at budget time, and we're, we're talking about <coughs> proactive planning for the next year. We have an idea of what the budget's going to be. Teachers aren't getting pink, pink slips because we're, we're trying to, you know, we're, we're, we're playing poker to figure out the budget and it's really refreshing. This, this whole reorganization with the elementary school special ed, you know, it, it's, it's thinking forward, it's thinking within the, the money that you have. And, you know, I, I commend you and the mayor and, and Susan Wright for pulling all of this together. It's really cool. Um, so, um, so my question is, because we just, uh, uh, 
voted on a resolution around living wages the, the other week, and um, that the sub rates are at minimum wage right now, and I'm wondering if, it, uh, if at some point we're talking about turning that into a living wage. Well, I'm not sure what the difference um, in terms of dollars between minimum wage and living wage is. We have made a commitment to try to keep the sub rates on par, at least, with minimum wage, which has been a struggle for us. Um, you know, we increased it last year. We increased it this year. Um, I would suspect we'll probably increase it next year. But um, that's just to keep up with minimum wage. I don't think it would be um, truthful for me to say here that I felt that I would be recommending to the school committee to take whatever step is needed to go from minimum wage to living wage for subs, just because in the context of all the rest of the needs of the budget, um, my, own, my own opinion would be that some of the other needs, I think, would come before that. Councillor Klein, do you have a question? I have a quick question. Um, so you talk about the fiscal cliff showing up in FY 2021. Um, and we've heard from the mayor that the fiscal cliff overall for the city would be fiscal year 2020. Is that, does that sound right? So 2021. are we looking at 2021? I mean, how has Proposition 2.5 that was passed in 2014 kind of affected that? Um, and has it given us extra years? You mean the override? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah, sorry, the override. Up two and a half past a little while. Thank you, thank you, yes. I'm not really sure that's a question for a department yeah, head. Might be more a mayor fun. question, but. Do you want me to try to answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, so what, I, what I'll say is that we've tried to be good stewards of the money. When we first did our five-year projection, we were looking at a cliff that came much earlier. I think the first time we took a look at this, we felt it would hit around probably 18 or 19. Um, we were able to make some adjustments in last year's budget and also make some adjustments with this budget that have been able to push that out. Some of the um, changes really have been in school choice. We had some money at the end of last year that came through what's known as the special ed increment, um, which is additional funding that we receive for students with disabilities who we take through choice. We held on to that money, so that pushed out the cliff a little bit. Um, this year, we're anticipating that we're going to get a similar um, increment, which pushes out the cliff a little bit farther. So um, we can't make it last forever, but we're trying to make it last as long as we can in a way that I think is very similar to the way you all are implementing the budget for the city. Councilor <clears throat> um, As I've said before, essentially the budget is, is, despite its dryness, is a moral document. It's an expression of what the community's um, values are, where we, where we choose to invest. And um, as represented in this budget, which is over 51 percent is to schools and actually more if you include pension and other liabilities, the fact remains it's still never enough, in fact, to meet what we most aspire to. So, and recently, of course, you've already addressed this in some level, and Councilor Nash addressed it as well. Of course, there was a there was a bit of a controversy because what you proposed was a significant change. Important fact, it should be noted, what you proposed is best practices, which was to provide um, for an inclusive experience for everyone who attends the Northampton schools uh, with professional access to professional services, and. Um, you have set a new gold standard for the way the school works. I understand that there was some consternation. It always comes with every significant change, and this was a significant change. And and, I, and the one thing I do want to address is that on social media, which we know is not the best propagation point for good information, let's say, there was a suggestion at one point that there was a 60% or 66% reduction in uh, in employee services in the school system. And if you could just clear the air on that one point, that would be great. I'm going to resist the urge to call it fake news or alternate facts. I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just say that it's incorrect. Uh, if you look even within our ESP unit, which is the unit that would be most affected, 
we're not talking about a 66% reduction. Um, within the ESP unit, we're reducing probably more along the lines of 20%, but that's to add teachers. Um, so overall, there, there is a lower head count in this budget than there was in the prior budget, but that's because it reflects a strategy of um, reducing some lower paid employees in order to hire more higher paid employees, and that's really the only difference. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, I, I know you and your staff have been involved in some of the conversations about the the blue community resolution that's been that's passed on first reading, and though it's not law, it's just aspiration. Nonetheless, the aspiration is that over time, uh, the availability and the sale of uh, single-use plastic water bottles in municipal facilities would be phased out, and we had we did that knowing that the department most affected, uh, both in terms of use and some dollar impacts, would be the, would be the schools. I'm just, I'm just curious if uh, you've, you're comfortable with the, the, the possibility that that be implemented over time with a minimal budget impact. One thing that I would like to bring to the council's attention is the strong position that the school committee has taken on lunch shaming. Um, which is the practice that you may have heard in the news of um, doing something to designate students with unpaid lunch bills that um, can be stigmatizing. You know, there are schools that, that provide uh, a different kind of lunch. There are schools that uh, have little stamps they put on kids who have a, have a negative balance. But our committee said, no, that's not going to happen here. And as a result, um, we do have some bad debt. And one of the changes in the federal school lunch program said that we can't have bad debt at the end of the year. So school committee has to take money from its, its budget in order to cover the bad debt. Doesn't forgive it that we still go after um, people who owe us money. But it does mean that that leaves less funding for the rest of the school program. So one of the things that we've been able to do to sort of address the issue of bad debt is by increasing revenue through a la carte sales. One of the pieces of a la carte sales that have been very effective for us this year has been water sales. Um, and so my discussions, my discussions with the gentleman who's sort of the driving force behind the blue, blue communities has been we can reach a middle ground here, but at this point, I can't really abide by a ban on, on selling water because it's the sale of the water that's covering the debt so the school committee doesn't have to backfill it so that we don't have to take resources away from kids. Um, so there may be other um, solutions. We're looking at fundraising for bad debt, and we're looking at other um, ways of trying to make the school lunch program more um, I shouldn't say viable because it is viable, but it has this problem that other businesses have in a different way, which, which is, you know, how to address the debt. Uh, so we basically where we where we ended up with that was that we could be supportive of fill stations um, and we could work together on that. But at this point, we're not comfortable with a ban because we know that it would end up just taking resources away from students. Thank you, and, and of course we, we don't regard it as a ban. We regard it as a as, a, as an objective down the road to shoot for. But but, but uh, that, that, that explanation is very helpful. Thank you. Hi, Thank you. Um, my understanding, maybe I'm wrong, is that the way the method of counting to determine um, eligibility for free and reduced lunch is changing, or may change. And I just think, briefly editorialize, thank you for your comments about um, you know, standing and for, for the school committee for standing against lunch shaming. Uh, kids shouldn't have to endure that. But it's, despite your efforts, it says something that you have to sell um, water bottles and other things to make up the difference. And it's a shame that the state doesn't step in and provide that. So. 
I'm just wondering, given, but the specific question is given the changes in the, in the counting, uh, are you going to be under new pressure uh, financially in terms of free and reduced lunch? I have not heard that the methodology of, I, of qualifying students for a free and reduced lunch is changing. We do have the Open Gateway, which is a computerized system that connects all the different support networks in the state, mm -hmm. which helps uh, us to identify kids. What the change that um, I'm, I'm connecting with from what you're saying is free and reduced lunch was the measure that was used to identify economic need in Massachusetts. Uh, about two years ago, that changed from free and reduced to what's now known as economically disadvantaged. The economically disadvantaged standard is much higher. Mm -hmm. um, it was something that didn't make a lot of sense. I'm, on the face of it, it looked like a way of sort of creating a better picture because right. Right. we went from, you know, more than 40% of kids eligible for free and reduced lunch to 28% of kids economically disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. It was the same level of economic wealth and, and the same kids, but it was a different metric. Um, so, I, but I think it's important, and I'll just say this since public may be watching, that you don't have to be economically disadvantaged in order to qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, that standard is still the same. We have a lot of kids who qualify for free and reduced lunch who are not considered economically disadvantaged under the new metric, and we'll continue to um, make them, to seek them out. It's one of the strategies to address debt, because mm -hmm. obviously once a family becomes eligible for free and reduced lunch, then they can't accumulate any further debt. Um, and it's also just a way to try to help families make sure that kids are well fed. So uh, what, I, what I foresee in terms of changes to the federal school lunch program is more around the components of the program. Um, there, there's, I haven't seen the exact new proposed regulations, but I know that there's been uh, concern under the current administration to sort of roll back some of the um, regulations that were put in place in an interest to try to make school lunches more helpful. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where I see the, the change likely to come in the school lunch program. Okay. Well, thank you for your attention to all that. Um, yes, so just to sort of beat this point, no, um, no ESPs are going to be losing their jobs. We are just not hiring to uh, fill positions that normally are lost for attrition, right? That's correct. Okay. okay. Um, and then my other question is, so but one, one position that isn't going to be funded for the next year is the, the librarians in the four elements. So two librarians split between the four elementary schools. Um, do you anticipate, I mean, it's hard to imagine into the future, but do you anticipate that until we reach that cliff and need to deal with that, that those positions will remain unfilled? I think if we, if we're to think about that again, we have to think about restructuring the position. Mm. The reason that we ended up reducing them was not really to make the other things work. It was because we didn't get the value add we thought we were going to get from those positions. Um, principals said that using them half time, the way we had set it up, it was either two half day, you know, a half day at each building, or three days and two days, and then they would switch. Um, just really wasn't a um, appreciable change from what they had when the when the library was being run by ESPs. Mm -hmm. So that was why we went back to running uh, the library with the ESPs. That's one of the places where we created new ESP positions that absorbed some of the people who are coming um, from programs from the prior ESP positions. So I, th I think of it not as an economic thing. I think of it as if we're going to redo elementary librarians, we have to make sure that it gives us the learning benefit for the public dollar we're spending on it. And, and um, at least some of the schools, if not all of the schools, are working to redo their libraries too. So is that part of or is that part of the thinking of how how to just use those spaces more efficiently and use staff more efficiently in those spaces? Yeah, the sort of the, the trend <laughs> in school libraries is to be much more kid focused um, and to be much more interactive. Both of the schools that are looking at new library spaces are uh, experimenting with makerspace ideas, which are basically places where you put technology and things that kids like to tinker with and let them go at it. Um, so that's kind of a new concept in libraries. And then the other piece is making them much more electronic, 
Not that books and magazines are ever going to go away, but a lot of the content that kids are accessing, they're accessing electronically. So you think of um, computer racks and tablet racks um, and all kinds of features that don't exist in our current libraries. So again, you know, if we redo it, it again, you know, you think about do we want sort of a traditional school librarian or do we want more of a library media specialist or someone with even a technology background? So that may be in the future at some point, um, but I would just say that the answer for the librarians is they didn't work out like we thought they would. We gave it a try and we evaluate things and if they're not working to our satisfaction, we try again. Thank you, that's helpful. Thanks. Um, any questions for Cyberland? Or the, uh, Cyberland is silent. Cyberland is silent. Okay. Doesn't smoke, was Doesn't smoke. How about um, from the crowd here in the room, anybody have a question for the superintendent? I don't know if we've identified uh, a city or a school in okay. India. Yeah. All right, good. Mm -hmm. And uh, just because it came up, uh, the, the, this is the first time we've talked about, in fact, this is the first time I've heard it, the fiscal cliff. Um, but what, what we're kind of talking about is the longevity we'd get out of our last general override, which has lasted longer than I thought it would. And I'd like to assure people that both on the school side and the city side, you know, we, we and the mayor's office and the department heads have done what they can to stretch that money as long as they can. But I think it's realistic to expect that that, that stretch will eventually run out 21 maybe, 2021. And if it's 21, we'll be dealing with it in 20 when we do the 21 budget. Um, but I want to assure people we, we have been good stewards of the money they gave us with the last general override. That we've gotten more life out than we thought we would, but it will come to an end at some point in time and people will have to examine their resources and their aspirations because something will eventually show up to say if you want us to continue to provide the services that we've been providing, that we're gonna have to go back and ask for the funds to do it for an ex another extended period of time. So it's out there and, and I'm glad we're addressing it now, both uh, on the school side and on the general government side so that we <coughs> our eyes wide open and know when the time comes. So thank you, Superintendent Provost. And uh, we appear to be pretty much right on time. And it's time for our second superintendent to come on down and. Good evening, everybody. I'm Kevin Farm, your interim superintendent at Smith Vocational Agricultural High School. And it is my first time in my almost 40 year career in career and technical education that I've been the second superintendent in a, uh, in a municipality or in a region. Um, I want to thank the mayor. I want to thank uh, John Provost and the Board of Trustees uh, as well as the council for, for all the help this year and uh, as we transition and get ready to uh, hopefully select the next uh, permanent superintendent for, for your uh, premier independent vocational agricultural schools. You noticed it's the only independent vocational agricultural school in the Commonwealth. Uh, we've taken a close look at that, at that uh, governance structure, and uh, we're speaking with local legislators, state legislators, in order to find out what works best for the trustees, for the community of Northampton, and for the children who obviously attend that wonderful school of 108 year history. Um, currently, uh, in this particular budget, we were able to identify some areas that were in, in a, needed a great deal of uh, attention. And those areas were uh, uh, vocational programming um, that only had one teacher with a vocational aid. And I found that uh, somewhat troubling. And uh, in order to be in full compliance with Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and because we had the tuition revolving funds from our, uh, our sending students that come in from the surrounding areas, we were able to add some teaching positions for next year. <coughs> in areas where we're uh, having strong student enrollment, areas like um, agricultural mechanics. Um, and I will tell you that uh, we are focusing on the mission of Smith Vocational and Agricultural School because that's what it was founded on and we want to stay true to the will and to accent the agricultural, agricultural mechanics, animal science, landscape horticulture, and down the road in the future, looking at other agricultural programs like environmental science and technology, which takes into account water quality and wastewater treatment. 
to provide those kinds of skills into the workforce in the area. Um, we've also, because we, we s solved the uh, teacher's contract, I'm happy to say, uh, we added 25 minutes to the school day. We had one of the shortest high school school days of anyone in the Commonwealth. And when we, we have them, we need to have them there for a sufficient amount of time. So we were able to uh, settle the contract, add 25 minutes to the school day. Um, and I believe it, it cost the district uh, $70,000 overall for all of our staff to be able to do that. Um, at the same time, uh, we saw a, uh, a small increase in, as you can see on the screen, a small increase in Chapter 70 based on the fact that we had uh, 106 students from Northampton and about, uh, about 370 students or so from, uh, from our other surrounding communities. Um, last year, it was budgeted for about 330 uh, tuition students at 17,000 per student. And going forward, uh, we're budgeting for 375 tuition paying students for next year at $16,728 per student, which is the state designated uh, tuition rate based on the formula that they you know, use from year to year. Um, I did read the letter that the, the mayor had written a couple of years ago uh, regarding um, the fairness of some of the net school spending, and I want to speak with him more on that and advocate for his position um, at, at DESE because it, it really doesn't harm us, but it would help Northampton, I believe. So we'll, we'll have more conversations on that. Um, let's see if we got a few things here that I've forgotten. The budget seems like it's grown quite a bit, but then again, we're trying to accomplish a lot of things. Because we were able to add the 25 minutes to the school day, we actually add an additional period to our day on our academic side. So for the first time ever, we're able to offer Spanish to our students. And in our society today, uh, in, in especially in the world of work, whether it be our, our health technology students or our criminal justice students, being able to communicate with Everyone in our community, I think, is very important. So uh, that's something that's been in our uh, school improvement plan for quite a while, since 2014. Um, and it will also assist with college readiness and access. The um, students also weighed in on this, and th we found that the students really wanted to have that language option uh, for them as well. The over 60% of our budget is instructional with, uh, with faculty, um, and obviously uh, that was voted on by the uh, Board of Trustees uh, and moved forward. Uh, we've, we look that the future is bright under the current model, where we are a department of the city, but we uh, act very entrepreneurially. We look to attract students from the surrounding communities because those funds do help defray the cost of running our, our school. Um, we're, not, we're not looking at MSBA projects under my uh, administration. We're looking to uh, fix what we have and keep our house in order and try to live within the, the means that we've been given. And uh, the projections for the current budget is we will come in with a positive uh, on, the, on the current budget. So we're able to do that as well. And uh, it's been a very... Uh, very interesting, and uh, I'm going to miss this a whole lot when uh, when the time comes in the next few months. But I will tell you that it's been uh, it's been a great ride, and you're very very lucky. Ready for questions? I'm ready. Um, let's see. Let's start on this side this time. Councilor Skarin, you have a. Uh, no, I don't. Thank you. Councilor O'Donnell. Sure. Um, thank you for all your work. Um, I wanted to revive a question, I think, before you got here. Councilor Bidwell, to my left. I'll do my best to answer then, just before I got here. I'll repeat it to you. Okay. <laughs> um, basically, the question was, you know, if you had a little more resources, what are some of the things you would like to do? Well, obviously, some of them are on the capital side, mm -hmm. because we've got one classroom building which houses our, uh, our uh, advanced manufacturing program, our electrical program, carpentry, and our cabinet making program that was built in 1948. Uh, we did lose a piece of that roof this spring uh, and our uh, yeah. insurance company paid us $50,000. We repaired that roof immediately. What about non-capital? Non-capital? Yeah. 
Um, I think we're spot on to where we need to be right now as okay. far as programming goes. Okay. Uh, we are going to be involved uh, at the state level with what's called the Workforce Skills Cabinet, mm -hmm. which brings together labor, economic development, and education. We're going to sit with the folks of the Franklin Hampshire uh, Regional Workforce Investment Board, and we're going to look at what do we offer, what are the kinds of credentials that we provide to students upon graduation that are marketable in the workforce. Mm -hmm. And how can we make sure that we're providing the right education for the employers in our neighborhood? The, the, the employers will be at the table, the educators will be at the table, um, and the, the politicians will be at the table. And this is going on throughout the, the Commonwealth. And uh, we're going to be at that for, uh, for this particular region. Well, most of the vocational technical schools uh, throughout the state will, will have representation on those meetings. Thank you. And there's one line item in your budget. I remember I asked this of your predecessor um, in, in 2014. Um, it's your athletics budget. Mm -hmm. um, in fiscal year 2013, it was $26,000. Right. And then the following year, it increased $115,000. In fiscal 17, it's $186,000, and the proposed fiscal 18 is 230. So I'm just wondering if you could speak to the increase in your athletics budget and explain the value of it for a vocational school like yours in terms of what's the educational value? Well, of I think I think athletics are a fantastic opportunity for all students, regardless of whether they choose it. Uh, a comprehensive and academic or vocational technical school. Um, my predecessor did bring in a number of teams that had not existed uh -huh. prior. And I think some of the attraction for our students, in addition to the technical programming and the academic programming that they offer, is that students like to have that, that athletic outlet as well. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that uh, uh, I think it was yesterday the baseball team qualified for the state tournament the first time in five or six years. The volleyball team hopefully is winning as we speak. And be, okay. you know, so the, it, it, I think it raises all ships to have a, a very vibrant athletic program. So it's more of a community benefit than it has real no educational value. And the budget has increased. I, oh, okay, I, good. I think athletics uh, and teamwork. Okay. It's like what we teach in the shops. In order to work in industry and work okay. in, in the workplace, you have to learn those teamwork kinds of skills. And those are transferred to the athletic field, to the workplace, and to the home. So it does have educational value in terms of fundamental skills, Absolutely. according to you. So it's comforting to know that since it's, it's increased by a factor of 10 over five years. Well, I guess uh, when, when... Is it hit its ceiling or is it going to go think, I think it's leveled off, to okay. the truth, because uh, we've added what we've added. Um, and uh, the numbers are very strong, okay. both at the, at the JV and the varsity level. And I'm, I'm not sure what my subsequent administration yeah. will do, yeah. but I, w I would not be adding any sports at this time. Perhaps it helps with recruitment of students as well. It absolutely does. Okay. It absolutely does. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Councilor Goodwell. No, don't. No, Councilor um, Yes, thank you, and thanks for all the work you've been uh, doing and uh, stepping in. Um, couple of things. Oh, well, I wanted to congratulate you. I know I did hear that um, the Capital Skills Grant Program uh, award. Mention. Yes, for the electrical was less. Electrical and advanced manufacturing, $401,000. Right, right, which um, I know was something that's going to replace really outdated equipment. I know you said the building was old, but I did teach there myself in the that's electrical right too. shop. That's right. Yeah. And it was, you know, they still have the same, they had the same materials there it's for the, uh, decades. You know, the, uh, the programmable logic controls yes. that electrical needs. Gentleman that's the manager over at Coca-Cola, he and I have met, and this is exactly what he needs is someone that understands that. So now we're going to have a direct pipeline right here from a great company that's right here in Northampton. And, and those are the things we want to do. <clears throat> and just to have that funded by the state is really, really great for for the city. Um, I, don't, I don't think I have anything else. I just congratulate you on all the work you're doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I, <coughs> I would just add to that, Superintendent Farr, your interim uh, tenure is I it's significant by its absence of drama. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, <laughs> in fact, I think you've provided a stability that, I mean, you're put in a very difficult position <laughs> as in interim status. 
uh, particularly when you're transitioning between administrations and you, and and everything else as we deal with these kind of um, budget challenges that uh, your stability has I think made a significant or an absence of, of, of a dramatic impact while at the same time providing that stability that's actually critical and 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 I also thank you for your fluency of your budget and your description of such and and very much appreciate it. Well, I, time spent. I, it's not a job you can do by yourself, and I really appreciate uh, Chairman Mike Galen, uh, Vice Chair uh, Tom Fitzgerald, John Cotton, Mayor Narkowitz, and John Provost, who sit as our Board of Trustees, because uh, that's all part of this work. And uh, that's a great staff. It's a great administration. And I'm going to be someplace next year. I'll be watching, and uh, we're going to see great things. Well, again, thank you. So I have no questions. Councilor No, I, you know, I, I just want to say um, that um, as somebody who's been involved in vocational work in the Valley for years, Smith Folk does just a, a terrific job, you know, in terms of, I've, I've worked with high schools in terms of developing internship programs and outreach for students. Smith Vogue doesn't need it because they've been doing it already for years. And when their students leave school, more than likely they have a job waiting for them um, that it, it's really quite remarkable. There's some new, some new literature that's just been released by that wor workforce skills cabinet. And you're going to see all schools are going to be doing internships. They're going to be doing shadowing and those kinds of things. And they're going to be doing interest-based maker spaces where they can tinker and, and, and get their hands on what excites them about being in school every day. Um, whether it's playing baseball or whether it's uh, building robots. So I think we're at a very good place. And uh, after being four years in Connecticut as a superintendent, boy, was I glad to be back in, back home in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Councilor LaBarge, do you have any questions for superintendent? Oh, I, yeah, I do. Um, I do have to say um, I have a lot of respect for Smith Vocational. Um, one of our family members um, was a graduate of Smith Vocational, and he has an unbelievable business for auto bodies on cars, and it's Full Tilt Auto Body, mm -hmm. huge business. They just bought a beautiful home, a commercial home. Their business is fantastic, and it's what he's learned from that school. And that's one of the stories that needs to be told more often from the administration going forward about the great things of the graduates yeah. of Smith Volk. Um, just a, I have a question about, uh, about a couple of items. Sure. A um, couple, couple of, of totals. Um, I noticed the principal, vice principal line went up by about 18 and 3 quarters percent. There was also another big jump in building technology. Could you just address why that occurred? <coughs> this particular budget building technology is we're budgeting for our one-to-one -one iPad program with that we started this past year mm -hmm. um, and we need to you know fund that every year uh, it was not in the budget this past year so that's why it looks like an increase mm -hmm. um, and those other line items are uh, based on uh, uh, contract negotiations we're not sure what those numbers would be and those would be placeholder uh, figures uh, for the, those positions for those contracts are done do we have any questions from cyberspace? Cyberspace is yeah. by empty at the moment. And uh, how about for members of the audience here, does anyone have a question for Superintendent Farr on the Smith Folk budget? Uh, Superintendent, is it a success in the robot field? It sounds fun, I don't know. It is. I'm a part-time mechanic. There's a lot, a lot of success for Yeah, a little electric engines and stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, there you go. Well, thank you, Superintendent Farr, for coming here. Thank, thank you for your years thank with you. us. And I also, want to, I want to recognize Susan Wright, also, who's a great partner. Uh, and as we transitioned in our uh, our business manager role, Nancy Roberts retired, and I have Crystal Fairman, our uh, our new business manager, with us. She's doing a great job, and our principal, Dr. Andy Lincoln Hoker, is here as well. And. Uh, Okay. Thank Nobody you. Okay. I'm here. I Thank you so much. We're rooting for you, you, and it's been productive for us as Thank well. Thank you. I'm rooting for you, you as well. Thank you very much. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. <coughs> Excellent. Um, so that completes that portion of our agenda.
Um, is there any business on the Finance Committee side that we were unaware of? I know of none. Any finance members? I don't know of any. Then uh, in finance. I move okay. to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Just second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you.